wobbling foot to foot there. Back you go. Go, back you go. Go. You can wobble into there. Back you go. Back you go. Back you go. Grandmother's footsteps. In Grandmother's footsteps, one of the players stands facing the wall at one end of the room, while the others are behind him or her at the other end of the room, and they creep up quickly and quietly. Whenever the one who is it turns round and spots anybody moving, they're sent to the end of the room and have to start again. In Grandmother's footsteps, we're working on the control of movements which are quick, light and direct. You point when you, when you, if you hear a sound uh -huh. from them, I don't like to, okay. is that alright? No, you're okay. Okay, that's alright. It's a very expensive scarf, this, I hope you know. <laughs> Not using rubbish on you. Yes, please. No, no. No. Yes, please. Okay, go. Yes, please. Someone else? Okay. Yeah. No. Yep. Freeze. Okay. Yes, please. He's just going back. Okay. No. 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 Yep. Back. Bit unlucky there. Yep. Freeze. Okay. Yep, freeze till he gets back. Okay. No, 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 yes, freeze, freeze till she gets back. Okay. No. Yep. Yes. Freeze. 
Okay. Nope. <laughs> yes! Yes, please. Leave me money, leave me money alone. You're out. You're out. With your shoulder twitched. Okay, there's three on the floor at the moment. No. Yes, a knee. Okay. One and two on the floor at the moment. Yes! <laughs> she just got you. She was right that time. The time before, she was about six inches behind you. I was trying to catch you. Okay. You can construct sequences of games in which you take someone from what is comfortable to them, what they are happy with, into areas that they, they're not happy with, that they have to, to rework at. Uh, you can go from this into a number of things, you can go from this. Once you've introduced the blindfold, then you can get into, into touch games. You can get into, into identity, you can get into, into mazes. I don't know, as Boy, Boy Scouts we used to put planks across chairs and hang, hang jam jars with stones in them or something like that, and you used to find your way from one end of the room to the other without making a noise at all. Like that. So that, that there is a function in games to, to train quite specific. Some, I, I, I don't know how it grew up, but it's obviously that's the point of it. People have started playing games because to explore certain characteristics of movement. Okay, well we're on blindfolds. There's a, a moment in the Scottish play hmm where the hero s stands on stage surrounded by his enemies except they're all back in the dressing room having coffee <laughs> uh, but he has to physicalize those enemies and the speech the, the text that um, Shakespeare gives him which I always paraphrase because I, I never remember it creates takes the image of bear like they have tied me to a stake and I must run my course. He gives the, the image of a bear tied in a bear garden to a, to a large tree trunk or something and attacked by dogs and the bear is blinded. And this is one of those happy, friendly uh, sports the English have indulged in over the years. Uh, okay, so to try and make something alive for her, you've got your... <laughs> anyone who does it, it's very light, it's got to be very light. One dead dog. Okay, keep it quiet then. Ooh.
uh, but it leads us to, to understanding certain things. That, that is quite near the end of the play. And uh, what this releases in there is energy. All too often, if the, if the character does not personalize those enemies, does not physicalize them, then at that point he gets into a sort of romantic, melodramatic fall, you know, bear-like, they have tied me to a stake and I must remember, and all the energy goes out to the end of the play, and the play goes, <laughs> the end. Whereas with this, we're giving the man in that situation energy to physicalize those, those things, so we get something of what I think Shakespeare intends us to see with the character at that point, somebody who is really locked by his own violence and, and, and can't find a way out. Craig gave us the great line that the center of it is the spy of, 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 of Elsinore, are the spies. Denmark's a prison. So it's full of spies, each of whom was whispering in corners. Uh, but he doesn't know which one is, who is a friend and who is an enemy, who is the whisperer and not. So what you've got to do now, uh, we whisper in our own way, is find the whisperer and kill them, which is exactly what Hamlet does within the play. And he finally, I think, which might be the object of the game, I don't know, gets the wrong one, gets the wrong person. Uh, kills Polonius. Okay, we start the whispering then. You've got to find us, Dick. Find out who's whispering. So that the movement pattern becomes uh, this, this what, not knowing goes one way, goes back the other way, goes that way, goes this way, goes that, and then ends with a cloud. Uh, and that's very much worked out in the pattern of, of Hamlet. I mean, the one speech that stands out in all English dramatic literature has a geography in it. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler, there's a whole geography within that speech. It, it doesn't make sense to say, to be or not to be. That is the question. It doesn't make sense. It's on one hand, on the other hand. So it's part of, it's, if we accept that speech, which, which obviously you've got to say because of history, it's the one that stays, is the one that has something of the essence of, of, of uh, Hamlet's position, is he doesn't know which way to go. To be or not to be? That is the question. Whether, or, and it's on one hand, the other hand, it has a whole geography built into it. Oedipus is different. Oedipus has to find out who has the truth. Count ten, and at that point you start to find where the truth is. Yeah, move the lot between us, move it around, yeah. Right, okay. Right. That's it. That's it. Okay, okay, we haven't got it. It did it just and you passed me twice. Who's got it? Who's got my money? But that's part of Oedipus, which is all the time in a range of directions and, and the, the sudden 
fixation, the sudden directness, the intensification of the directness of whoever he's talking to at that time, he's got it, he's got it, no. It's got to be somebody else we go to. Um, eh? yeah. So that uh, there, is a, there is a way in which you can begin to, on very simple games like this, uh, begin to think, what is the game of, of this character? What's, where, what, what is the game that, that incorporates the movement? Or uh, use a game as a way of investigating the character. Uh, as saying, well, it's not, it's, not, it's not the Scottish play, it's not Hamlet, it's not Oedipus Rex. Who is it? Who is it? Uh, I don't know, I've never worked on Othello, but it would be interesting to try and find out what the game is with Othello who can't trust what he sees and can't trust what he hears either. I don't know, that would be, that would be interesting. You can't move until she moves. Got you, got you. I'll show you why in a minute. I'll show you why you got you, got you. Why do they need it? <laughs> Who knows, maybe slight of hand is very useful. <laughs> Good, good, good. I'm going to close my eyes so I can't see. You're quick. You're quick. I will slow that down. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't slow me down to close my eyes. In fact, it, it, if my reactions were that fast, it quickens you up, because it's the eyes that pull you off balance. The, I mean, the worst way of playing the game, which is the instinctive way, that when in grown ups is, is that you go and and you look at the other. You look at his hands, and the moment you do that, you just you just connect the head from the body. That is, we have a, a function which is called the eye writing mechanism, which we usually use when we're very tired or we, we're, we're, we're ill. That is, normally we, we orient ourselves in space according to other people and, or other objects in space. Only when we get very drunk or very ill, you know. And this is why if you walk upstairs very carefully, you fall over. Um, it, what you do is you switch the eye to the front brain where the will is, I must do this. Or, you, it, it's the same in schools when people say, you can't vault, vault! This time make yourself vault, you know, and you, you get even worse. Because the eye writing mechanism connects with the front part of the brain, the front part of the brain has no connection with the muscles of the body. The muscles of the body are all connected in the back, so that if you actually do that, uh, you, 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 you know, your, your eyes see the hands move, and they, the front brain says, he's moved his hands. <laughs> and they send it to the back brain, who say, saying, he's moved his hands. And the, you know, by that time, you're, <laughs> you're totally and utterly kavunked. Uh, I mean, which whatever every boxer says, and we don't watch his punches, watch his eyes, he telegraphs in his eyes. He doesn't telegraph anything at all. Most of them are punch drunk anyway. But by, by actually watching his eyes, you coordinate your own body properly. You coordinate the head and the, and the spine and, and the, the messages start to, to run through. Right? Very silly children's game. Finger fencing. You know it? 
you have two fingers. What you're trying to oh, do is score it. points by, by touching your opponent in the small of the back while stopping your opponent from touching your back. Okay. <laughs> okay, joint. Okay, off you go. Okay, 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 second group. This is one of a series of conflict games in which you have to risk what you have in order to get what you want. But this is a clash conflict. Sometimes you see that. that there, there were a couple of times watching you up the side and some of the other groups as well that, that people are going like that, but they're not within miles of touching anybody. <laughs> uh, it's like that, or sometimes uh, people go right and attack, and the two they cl literally clash in the middle. What was missing, although I, you know, I mean, I've been at it a long time now, was was the give and take of, of that you would expect in boxing or fencing or any anticipatory events like that. That that you, you, you keep balance between defense and attack. Uh, most people get tied up with the mental activity of attacking or defending. The coin on your left hand. Each with the coin or one with yeah. the coin. Yeah. Each with the coin. Yeah, each with the coin, yeah. So you, you use your coin to, to distract your opponent while stealing <laughs> Your opponent's coin. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry. I've Yeah? Okay. Yeah. So the object is to, to risk more closely what you've got to get <laughs> what you want. Okay. Right, then certain rules then. Certain rules. No clenching the fist. I know, I think that's it. No clenching the fist. No knocking the hand down like that. Okay. And those people, anybody, Anybody playing this game who puts their hand behind their back should see their psychiatrist tomorrow morning because if you can't resist, you can't risk spikepants in your hand, you have serious personality problems. Okay, off you go. <laughs> oh, what's he doing? <laughs> it is like a nice dance, isn't it? <laughs> Don't bang his fist, Alan. You can't hit his money. <laughs> but he has problems. Okay, okay. Oh no, sorry, I'm coming, no, sorry. I told you I'm no good at this game. <laughs> all right, all right, finish the game. End the game, that's it, that's it. Call it off. Okay. And it's, it's, it's not impaired. It's behind your back. Coin is behind the back. So it's now a group game. 
in which we move around. And if your coin's stolen, you're out. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Rules. No violence. No violence. No clenching. No, no standing close to the to the curtains and bouncing up and down, and no running. It's a walking game. No running. Okay. Find yourself a safe place to start. Okay. Right. Off you go. No running! <laughs> no running! Okay, five players. Okay, four players. Each no no go to corners. Take the four corners. Take the four corners. Okay. Right, four players. Let's watch carefully what happens with four players and then three players. Okay, three players. <laughs> three players. Okay, ease off him. No. Okay, three players, let's go. No running! You won't get it with two unless unless there's violence somewhere. <laughs> okay, find yourself a safe space. No Again, the same rules, no standing next to the wall, no violence. You can only touch the tail. You can't touch adults and hold them while you do something. Uh, and no running. No running! Pakuran! <laughs> no running. Skipping counts as running. Standing next to the wall. Okay, we got three. Let's watch the three. <laughs> no 
we've got close to, to, we're on the edge of the most scientific areas of training in theatre because we're into proxemics. When you have three or four players in this, then obviously it's a game of broken alliances, alliances and betrayals all the time, during which someone, by changing their position in space, can break the alliance and create another one. And, uh, and so that it's a constant fluid battle for finding the place in, stage, in, in space to avoid one character and make an alliance with another. This is what theatre should be about. That is, the stage should reflect constantly through the changes of the, the, the bodies of the people on stage, the, the attitudes to uh, acceptance, denial, to, you know, argument in, as the argument develops in the play. Um, it doesn't. Very often actors take a position and they stand there like that and you can't see the changes of of thought, the changes of reaction within the bodies of the actors. It doesn't mean that you have to move around and dodge like that. It may, may mean any movement. Movement is just a shift of the weight, of the balance of the body's weight over stance. So it may only be a move from one foot to the other foot in that case. Or it may even be a turn of the body or, or an intensification of the look. But it's a movement in space that communicates to the audience what the, 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 how the, the attitudes of the actors to each other and to the argument are developing. And very important in Shakespeare. And Shakespeare is probably the one that we, we most sort of either tread, just tread that down or stand holding spears or other boring, uncommunicative things. Mm -hmm. It's the same game in its way, except, excuse me, but no tails. This time I'm, I've taken the coins away, this time I'm taking the tails away. So it's following the pattern of activity in the previous game, but uh, how you change the relationships to dominate, to avoid, to make contact with, you play with the game, but without the, the silly aspect of trying to steal tails or something like that. Okay. No running, no words, you use sound, we can't use words, and no Marcel Masso, no, okay. No, no descriptive mime. <coughs> okay? Find yourself a space to start. Eh? I mean, I, I, if I make a criticism, it's not a criticism, it's a comment. That the people were too anxious to get into it and do something, rather than find out what it was like just to be there in the first place. 
That's all. It's, it's, it's of no consequence. I mean, what the game is, is basically the, uh, the, the, uh, the working at Romeo and Juliet. Those scenes where people walk and challenge each other, first of all the servants and then the younger, younger men walk the streets and challenge each other without being allowed to go into direct violence or things, or how you challenge someone, how you defend your space. It's West Side Story. It's it's everything like that. And a lot of that came out. And when you're ready, when something inside you moves you to move, then move. Okay? And the last game, then, is, uh, is really where I think the heart of theatre is, which is, you know, what we know. We know several things about theatre, those of us who've been in it. Uh, it's axiomatic that you learn your lines and you know the text, but you don't know the text by trying to remember it the text is so far sunk inside you that the text just comes out. I mean, that's, there's a whole problem, if you want to go into it, a whole pattern of, of what's the next line, this, you know, what's the answer to what that character said is this, you know, and there's a whole questioning going on inside you which produces that text. But you have to know the text. You have to, you have to act subconsciously. Uh, I'll say of my old master, Joan Littlewood, she used to say, never go out on stage to be efficient. Go out to fail and you might succeed. And that's true, you have to, you can't work off conscious control on the stage without getting hopelessly bogged down. Uh, so that in this, what I'm doing is, uh, in this last game, is trying to get people to, to wait until something inside them or not outside them, or, although it may be that there is a response inside them to something that they see happening elsewhere in the space, um, but that they, they wait until something moves them rather than going in and saying, right, I'm going to move, rather than make a, making a willful decision to move or to do something, 
actually wait until the inspiration comes from the inside. Uh, it will come from the inside, particularly if you've actually done, uh, you know, you've done your homework. Uh, I've always thought with actors that the thing with actors is some actors are front foot actors and some are back front actors. My actors are back front actors. Back front. Yeah, because they're, they're then in the gathered, in Laban's terms, and then in the gathered position and balanced to come forward. Uh, and then they go back again like that. Uh, um, but, I mean, the essence of, of this game is, is uh, well, you could sort of say the essence of this is, is improvisation, you know. Uh, I don't think an improvisation should make a statement. Any improvisation should ask a question or respond to a question that's already there. I mean, what you find on the theatre very often, uh, so often, is that actors are making statements all over the place and the floor gets littered with unanswered questions. Uh, and they make suggestions, they do things, they think of things, they are imaginative, they do all sorts of stuff like that, but nobody picks it up. Nobody is, is in tune with, with them, whereas this is a training in responding to small movements or small actions from the other person in space. Um, and, you know, I mean, then the question then, the question then comes, if you're improvising, what are you improvising on? How well do you know your, your, your material? You know, I, I mean, this is the, the question that comes from, that comes from music. Uh, people can improvise in music, but that depends on, A, how well do you know the ground, uh, the ground that's set for you to improvise on, how well can you play your instrument and how well do you understand the, the possibilities for, for, for further development. Uh, and so this is where I think this, where the, this is with me with jazz, you know, that actors are constantly there in a position of responding to whatever the other person does. Uh, and not making statements and not blocking off. Uh, and that they follow that pattern of the music. How well do you know the role? How well do you know what you're improvising on? How, how good is your technique for realizing what your response to that machine, that, that action is? Uh, you know, how well do you know your instrument? And what can you do with it? And so that seems to me you know, if the improvisation, as every performance should be an improvisation, on what you've already done before through rehearsal, or, or, and so it should always be fresh in that sense. Uh, and this is one way of sort of, if you like, releasing that, of showing that, where's the theatre going, what's happening in it. Uh, sometimes I've done things which was, actors have shown me stuff of great beauty and, and and enormous interest. One of the most interesting was in Cali in Colombia where uh, I went into a, a, a college and uh, they didn't give me the students to work with, they gave me the staff. So I had musicians, I had composers, uh, musicians, I had uh, painters and sculptors and also technicians and things like that. And uh, but the thing was in its own right a work, a work of art because of the interaction between all these people, each of whom had some, you know, sort of inspiration, if you like, or aspiration. <laughs> and uh, and we could have put the thing in a museum and whatnot. We could have done the People would have turned up and watched it for days. I watched it for two hours. The, the last time we did it, it lasted two hours. And in the end, I had to end it because we were running time, but I could have gone on watching it forever. It the most fascinating piece of work. And the people who were involved in it came out, you know, sort of the painter said to me, you've given me, a, you've opened up to me ideas for a new path in the work I'm doing. It was quite, 
quite splendid. One of the great days of my life was that day. The first thing you notice about this is <coughs> that people are the center of their own space. They're not subservient to somebody else's center or, you know, they're, they're fairly diffuse in this. The other thing is that because this class had not worked for long before with each other, um, they tend to keep to the periphery of the space. They, they don't have the, uh, the confidence to take the center of that space so that they're all very much on the periphery. There's something about the periphery that pushes them slightly forward. The other thing, you know, I would point out of this is is how the bodies are pulled on center, are pulled on line. That is, you know, the uh, in terms of which that Harvard uh, College diagram of the line, th the coordinated line through the body, they pull very close to this, and uh, there's no they straighten out any bumps in the spine and the pelvis is, is in line with the head. There's a slight tendency in some of them to sort of still be intellectual and look at something so that the head pulls forward. And that, but that's particularly sort of due, I think, to their standing on the periphery. That is, uh, there's a sense in which the, the action should be somewhere in front of them and they look at it instead of uh, trusting themselves. It's very interesting how she responds to the other person invading her space. To a certain extent here, there's a sort of security in line. You know, the four boys get together and share a common space that way. And then they're breaking up but for a time. And the two girls over here, there was a sharing of common space. Uh, but that, that again is part, that's one of the options open, is you can always join someone or invite someone to join you, you know, physically. also you can see the sort of dithering in the two boys there as she moves towards them there's a, a counter attraction to pull away to the other boy there uh, they don't go but you can see there's a sort of inclination in that direction you see that What happens in the game, or what happens for me, uh, and what's the attraction of it for me, is that something is always likely to happen. So there's an anticipatory sense that maintains my interest, whereas too often in the theatre I see shows in which I know exactly what's going to happen, or, or uh, I'm going to be told what's going to happen. Uh, and so I'm not interested, I, you know, if I sit here long enough, someone will tell me. But on this, there's always a, there's always a, a prospect of surprise or a prospect of revelation or of things changing. Uh, I wanted to be uh, a writer, 
uh, and I bought a typewriter and I started writing short stories and I used to fill one page with description and then when it got to the action and the dialogue I couldn't get any further so I had a series of one page stories that never developed so I considered if I wrote plays it would be a damn sight easier because you didn't have to write the description you just went straight into the word so I bought all the books I got hold of all the books in the library on writing plays didn't do that quite by accident and I won't go into any great detail I uh, ended up going to the Bristol Old Vic School on a stage management course, since I didn't think anyone would accept me as an actor, uh, purely because my last drinking companion was given a job with the Bristol Airplane Company. So I said, I can't drink on my own, I'll come with you. So I went down to Bristol. I did one year there, in a, which was absolutely chaotic. It was such a mess that I went into the principal's office one day and said, you don't seem to know what to do with the first year. Can I do a production? He said, do two. Uh, I collapsed with a burst ulcer the day before the dress rehearsal, so I never saw either of them. Uh, during that process, someone who was teaching design said to me, uh, I've just met a company. They all wear beards and have dirty feet and wear sandals. they absolutely the company for you. I wore a suit or a sports jacket. I never wore sandals in my life, and I thought my feet were relatively clean. But I went down and, uh, on that basis, joined Theatre Workshop. Um, as someone said of Theatre Workshop, if you want to act for Theatre Workshop, don't do an audition, get a job in the bar. And so I became an actor uh, without any experience whatsoever. Uh, surrounded by marvellous people, I thought, if I'm going to stay in this business, I, I'd better learn how to do it. So I started to teach myself acting took a long time, it was a very painful process, at the end of which I have become the world expert on the actors' problems because I had all of them. I walked into all of the traps, every single one of them. Uh, I developed eight different ways of handling, handling text, since Littlewood said to me, every time you open your mouth you spoil the previous half hour's work. <laughs> Shut up, I used to give my lines to other people, in the days of uh, Buster Keaton being over. I, I decided to teach myself things. Uh, at a certain point, when we moved into the West End with the, the hostage, we wanted to keep going some of the training work we'd done with Gene Newlove at, at Stratford. So we hired a room, and uh, everyone moved to one side and left me at that wall. So I moved to join them, and they all walked across to that wall, and I got the message that I was going to lead the classes. So I started to do technical exercises, and I started to do pelvic pelvic whip and then hopeless, hopeless, hopeless. So I thought, well, we'll start dribbling a football in and out of, uh, in and out of chairs. I used to do that when I was a boy. Uh, and that seemed to get people moving. We weren't wasting our money. Then we started to throw balls at people to go on extensions, things like that. <laughs> just, then, uh, then, then I started to remember a whole mass of games I played in the Boy Scouts and in youth clubs. I know a mass of kissing games, but I've never been able to use them in workshops. But there's a whole lot of, of other games as well. And, and I've started to look at, at games and uh, how they worked. Uh, the first attempts were very clumsy. Uh, I, I, they were rushed. I kept pushing to make things happen. And, but slowly over the years, I've, I've got to learn how to relax. I think on those games and to create some frameworks in which people can use games to make their own discoveries relate with each other. Uh, and that's, that's gone on. Uh, at a certain point in time, I had a year in Birmingham where I was given a, a year of students. Uh, they said to me, uh, university education has to change change the structure, what structure do you want? I said, I draw a chalk line, anyone that crosses that line works with me. Uh, but I give no guarantees, I'm not doing productions, I'm not doing one play after another, but I will guarantee that whatever we do is related to the development of the people in that group at the stage they are at. And 13 people crossed the line. We had a year together, they did their normal university courses, and 35 hours a week with me. In the course of that year, no one was ill, no one was late, 
and no one was absent. This is practically unheard of, I think, outside of Nazi Germany. <laughs> uh, it wasn't an easy year, but as someone said, I may not like the other people in this group, but they're the only people I can work with. And in that way, I, I was given the opportunity to make the work systematic, to work out what really the scientific basis of not only what I was doing, but what other people were doing was as well. And at another point, that work was stopped, because although they'd said to me, uh, we have to change the structure when I did it, and I think I solved most of the problems of teaching drama in a university, they said, Ah, but if you continue, we'll have to change the structure. And I said, that's what you asked me to do. And they said, ah, it's too difficult, too difficult. So they stopped the work. So I sat down for a variety of reasons, thinking, well, that's the end of that. And I wrote a book, which was my epitaph <coughs> on everything I'd done. I thought, that's the finish. I'll put it down in the book, and I'll never do it again. Uh, and that started another career. Um, finish off the year after. The book was published, I developed cancer. I had four operations for cancer. I was then radiated, I caught rheumatoid arthritis with two more operations. Each time I go down, I come back. And the thing that sustains me is thinking about movement and thinking about actors. Uh, they told me there was no cure for arthritis and I cured it. I had a little bit in my hands, that's all. And I did that by my own methods of how the brain and the body works. I think movement, I work out movement, I develop ideas, and the body has improved until the arthritis is not a problem for me anymore. And it was, I was crippled with it. Um, but this has meant, in fact, that, that for a variety of these reasons, I've never had a broad framework to extend the work. What I've gone on is, since the book was out, people said, come here and do the work, come there and do the work. So I've gone on doing the same work. But I think it's become deeper and deeper and deeper and more refined. I'm more interested in, in how, what is the core uh, of, of acting? What is, I would say, the stance? What is, if Stanislavski said, sometimes on stage I feel right and sometimes I feel wrong, he started psychologically to, to look at that. He's not where he finished up, but that's where he started. I started from the point of view, if Stanislavski says that, I feel right, I feel wrong, that was a physical sensation. And therefore I started to, to examine the possibilities or the possible explanations for why an actor feels wrong and why an actor feels right. Uh, and I see that rooted in the kinesthetic coordination of the back brain the subconscious brain and the muscles, the physical uh, coordination of the body, the head, the neck, the spine, the mouth, and, and the pelvis. And so those are the terms in which I've, I've gone on working, looking at ways of inducing a feeling in the actor which corresponds, as far as I can say, to what Stanislavski meant when he said, I feel right. Along the way, we feel wrong. Along the way, we look at the mental processes, get in the way of the body, we look at freeing the actor up so that the imagination which is rooted in the subconscious can, can be uh, utilised and people can relate expressively to each other and that's about it. I retire. There was a, a, a production of a show called Oh, What a Lovely War, which, which made its impact in the British theatre in 1963-64. Uh, it's a song, it's done by clowns, it's a, it's a, it's a portrayal of the First World War, but of any war, as, as portrayed by clowns. That is, everyone wore white satin, white and black satin, and then put bits and pieces of army equipment over the top. When it was first 
mounted. It was mounted as a cooperative. The company brought in the research and they worked on the scenes in rehearsal until they achieved the form. Then they moved it into the West End. The point where it moved into the West End, the director rang me up and said, we're going to do a pantomime in the afternoon, uh, written by Lionel Barton and Peter Schaefer. Uh, do you want to be in it? So I said, yeah, yeah, great. I can't do that. We're doing it under the show in the evening. We're doing this in the afternoon. So I went in for that. And then she said to me, would you take over? in Lovely War. There's an actor in Lovely War who's not doing, can't do what we want him to do. Okay. Okay, great. I love the show. Marvelous show. Uh, so I watched the show again three or four times, watched it. I could see quite clearly what the actor was doing that was not, was out of step with the others. I could see quite clearly what she wanted doing there. But that's all intellectual, that's critical, that's perceived, that's not doing. Um, so I did some song rehearsals, I learnt the dance numbers, and I said to her, when are we rehearsing? She said, I'm very busy at the moment, we can't do it. We'll, 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 we'll find a day. I'm <laughs> going into a show in which I'm hardly ever off stage. So this went on for a while, and he said, Joan, when are we going to re- Oh, I'm very busy, I'm very busy, I'm sorry. It's, it's, I haven't got time at the moment, we'll fix some time. And I finally went into that show with two hours rehearsal. Uh, it's a full length show in which numbers run into each other, you know, you sort of march off stage on one thing, put that hat down, put another hat and a cape on, and you come on as a man on a horse. For a cavalry charge, like a cavalry charge, you die, the horse gets killed, and then you get up and you're into a dance number. Like, Poets would do all sorts of mime, like going to sleep, leaning on tent poles, like that. Also, did, but I never got the rehearsal. That's the hardest thing in it was a, a dance, a waltz that accelerated, da 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 da, with four couples coming together. God, you could have nightmares about the traffic problem. Anyway, so. I thought, okay, crap, I better do something about this because I'm obviously going to get to this show and I won't know what the show's about. I know a lot about the First World War because I grew up with people who fought in it. And I have actually got a considerable collection of material on the First World War, books, pictures, because that's all intellectual material. It's all there. You can't play a picture. You can't act a story. You know what the story is, but you can't recreate that story just by understanding it. So I actually went to the expense of hiring a rehearsal room for myself. And I thought, now, everyone had said, well, this is Brechtian Theatre and this is like Brecht. Uh, all except you and McCall, who had left the company, who said we were doing all this in the 1930s. It's very old hat. Uh, anyway, I booked myself a room and I started. Now, how do I start? I start with the, the march. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we start. Right, I am a soldier on a route march in the First World War going up to the front, and I have a limp. I lost the war. No, no, wait a minute. I got the limp, but, but I lost the war. So I thought, well, I'm, I'm out of practice. I don't. I haven't, I haven't acted for quite a while now. I better go back and, and do some more work on it. So goes, let's get this right. I am a soldier on a route march in the First World War. I'm walking up to the front. I'm passing dead horses and gun carriage. I've got a limp. I, normally the word comes. I, I've done this so long I trick it sometimes. But I've got a limp. And I got the limp and lost the war. Oh shit, I've got to do more work on this than, than I thought. I mean, uh, something wrong with, with me. I, I, I go back to the beginning and start again. Okay. I am a soldier on a route march in the First World War, and I have a limp. What happened to the war? Oh, fuck, I said. I shouldn't have signed a contract. I'm a director, really. I'm not an actor. I shouldn't have let myself in for this new end. So, this is condensed. The whole of this spread over a period of three weeks. This story goes over three weeks. So, I perceived, ah, I go back to the beginning. Okay, okay, 
right. I was a limping soldier in the First World War, and I was on a route march, and the pack on... Oh shit, not only did I lose the war when I got the pack, I lost the limp as well. I thought, oh shit, I should not have done this, I should not have signed the contract. Like, why didn't I stick to the things I know I do well? Why do I have to do this? So I go back and I start, okay, I am a limping soldier with a pack in the fur, and I'm on a route march. And I'm going up the front of my helmet, oh bugger me, I've lost the limp, the war and the pack now when I've got the helmet. Oh shit, now I've got to go right away back and I've got to take everything, wait a minute, I've got a limp, I've got a pack, I've got a helmet, I've got a rifle on that side, okay. I am a fully equipped soldier walking down the route march and I see some horse, oh shit, I saw the horses and lost the entire war. Oh fuck at me, oh I can't do this, what are you doing? should not have signed that contract. I actually got to the point at one point of saying, I could run away and disappear, <laughs> so they couldn't find me. You know that feeling. This, this is, John Berry always used to say, there's four days before the opening night in which you think, somebody could break a leg and we couldn't do it. <laughs> Boy, did I get this one. I got this, well, almost to the point of looking at the train timetables to see. It's a good job I didn't know you then. I probably would have come down to Cornwall and hidden out. Ah, oh, fuck me. How do I deal with this? Then it dawned on me. This was a rehearsal. Well, this, uh, this isn't, this isn't the battlefield. This is a rehearsal room, isn't it? Oh, that makes life a lot easier. Why, why don't I? Then it's not. The First World War ended 40, 50 years ago, so I don't have to recreate that. I only have to recreate the character. That's it. Okay, great. I was a soldier on a route march in the First World War, and I had a limp. And I, the limp came and I lost the war, and the war came back and I lost the limp. Oh shit, you shouldn't have signed this contract. This really was very bad. Go back and start again. Maybe you can do it this time, okay? Okay. I was a soldier on a route march in the First World War, and I had a limp. The limp kept coming and the limp kept going. So we go back to do what I did before and see if it's any different, you see. Okay. I was a limping soldier on a route march, walking up to, marching up to the front, and I had a pack on it. Began to look like Max Wall. <laughs> and his comic marching, his comic walks. When I, when I had the lift, when I put the pack in, I lost the lift. When I got the limp back, I lost the pack, and the war kept disappearing and coming back again. This, remember, this is over three weeks. Please, John, can we rehearse? I'm terribly sorry. We're gonna, we'll, we'll find some time next week. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. But I am an actor. All right, saying why did I'm not an actor? I am an actor. I'm not a soldier. I'm an actor. What would happen if I put it in the third person, past tense? We'll try it without much confidence. The soldier was on a route march in the First World War. I mean, I haven't said anything about a limp yet. I haven't got to the limp. And the limps appeared. I don't know, I didn't mention the pack, but the pack's come. Very curious, this is. My mind works before I ver verbalize. That is, the thought comes before the word, before the deal, before, in the narrative. We have a hope, we have a hope, we have a hope. The First World War may not be over before I get there. Okay. The soldier was on a route march in the First World War. I can do it. Thank God I got into the show. Then it came to me that a short while after this I was working with some students and I said, it's very interesting what I've discovered this, this time. 
about narrative tenses and things. The soldier was on a route march in the First World War. He had a limp, helmet. He passed some other soldiers sitting outside a ruined cafe. He waved. I'm involving everybody else in my narrative. If this is the narrative I'm telling, then they must be part of it. And that's how, that's how I arrived at this paradox, that it's only when, it's a stance, it's an attitude, it's an attitude of mind. I'm not suggesting anyone goes through life saying, you know, I am an upper class lady in the 1930s. You know? so, you can't do that, but it's how you phrase the work and what your attitude to the action is and what your attitude to performance is that produces this detachment and produces the confirmation, puts you in the center of things instead of on the periphery of things that deals in, it frees the imagination rather than create, recreate cliches. For some reason, I was staying with Geoffrey Reeves, and uh, it was two day. It was the the day I first met Clive was the day of Churchill's funeral. Now, a few days before, I'd been doing a class in Shrewsbury, an adult education class, and we'd been for a drink afterwards. And somebody told me that Churchill was dead. And I'd said, oh, I hear the butcher of Dresden is dead. And the guy, the guy, the, John Gobin, a friend that was with me, said, keep your voice down. <laughs> so, so I, when I went to London, it was much to my disgust. It was the, the day of Churchill's funeral and all the streets were mucked around, you, you know, and everything. So... When I got to Clive, Jeff, Jeffrey Reeves took me to meet Clive and uh, almost the first words that I said to Clive was it's, it's, uh, it's a terrible day to come finding your way through Churchill's funeral and Clive said to me, oh you should show a bit of interest in it, it's popular theatre <laughs> mm -hmm. and I think those are almost the first words I remember. <laughs> I remember Clive saying to me, yeah, yeah. And he, he completely, he, he affected my life just when I look back and think if I'd never met him, my life, I can't imagine how different my life would have been, you know. I mean, he just radically changed my life because he, he, he taught me all the stuff about, uh, about games and, 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 and I, I mean, I remember saying to him, I was starting a, a theatre workshop, it would be in Shrewsbury, I think, and and I, I said to him, I don't know idea how to go about it, <laughs> and he told me a lot of games to start with. And once he'd mentioned the word games, I found a, a book that Dorothy had when she was a girl guide, <laughs> and and I studied all the scout games in the, you, you know, all the games in the girl guide, and I went to this first workshop in Shrewsbury on a Saturday morning thinking well at least I'll, I'll start playing a few games and see what happens from there you know but I was a bit nervous because it was at Shrewsbury Art School and I thought oh these these smart uh, Shrewsbury uh, you know art students aren't going to take kindly to playing games and once we'd started on the games, I couldn't stop them. <laughs> I mean, it just turned into everybody was suddenly remembering games they'd played as children. And, and I mean, we just, 
we played for about eight hours, I think. Only there were, you know, the games that you played as a child, they were played played by savage adults. <laughs> yeah. so, do you know British Bulldog? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they were nearly killing each other playing British, British Bulldog. It was just extraordinary, and uh, and that was uh, that was our first. And and it was Clive saying to me, saying to me, oh oh, go and play some games with them, you know, that it, 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 that started me off on. Uh, I think what what happened was uh, Clive told me a number of. Uh, games that he played and they used to play them they were performing with John Littlewood I think it was uh, must have been the time of the Queer Fellow or something like that I'm not sure which play I think it was Queer Fellow but they were they were rehearsing with her or performing with her and between the afternoon and evening whatever it was they were doing uh, I think it was Brian Murphy that uh, Clive worked with. He and uh, he and Brian Murphy worked out a whole lot of verbal games that could be could be played, uh, and that was that 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 was how it all how it all began. All the stuff with games be began, you know. And of course, uh, Littlewood was was what would take anything that was suggested you, you know because she was trying to get out of this this uh, imagine that you're a parrot or whatever it was that people had to do in those days you, you know so she she took the she took the games with uh, you know just swallowed them straight away and 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 that that was how the whole thing this was these were in the very early days of theater theater workshop and and uh, and Clive, Clive and Brian Murphy, and there was someone else whose name I forget, were very much involved in 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 that whole process with Joan, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, when I say he, when I say he affected my life, because I, I mean he was the one that introduced me to more or less introduced me to Joan. Though, though I'm actually, <laughs> I, I've told you about the time I first met Joan. I, I no, go on. Is it all right? Can yeah, I tell you? Yes. And, and it was at the start, it was in the early days of uh, Oh What a Lovely War. And I was writing for Peace News at the time and I went to see Oh What a Lovely War, I was completely knocked out by it. And and in a matter of uh, a week or so, whenever I was anywhere free in London, I would drop in and see, see Oh What a Lovely War, you know. And this was a Saturday afternoon. And, uh, and I went to see the, the Saturday afternoon show and the, the place was half empty and the actors were performing to, and this woman came and sat next to me. I was sitting in about the third or fourth row of the stalls and this woman came and sat next to me and I had no idea who, who it was but I know she had a notebook and she's starting writing things down and after a bit she said to me, you don't want to take any notice of this fucking rubbish. <laughs> Which I think was the first sentence that, that Joan ever spoke to me. And uh, she said, well, we're just, we're just trying a few things out this afternoon. You don't, don't take any, any notice of I mean, Joan rarely uttered a sentence without using the word fucking at some time or another. You know? But that was how I... Uh, that was how I first uh, first met her. It was the first conversation I ever had with her. I said, "It's the fifth time I've seen it in a week. I think it's great." You know? <laughs> anyway, uh, there's another my, my favourite personal Joan Littlewood story happened years later when I had uh, when I had. Uh, this isn't about Clive at all, I'm sorry. It's fine, Joan Littlewood's good. <laughs> it too. happened year, years later, and I had some Australian people staying with me from the Queensland Theatre Troupe, and we went to see... A, they were interested in starting children's theatre in Australia, and there was some children's show going on that day, and we went to see this uh, this matinee, and I wasn't... Uh, 
and we were just leaving the theatre, <laughs> and this voice behind me said, what the fucking hell are you doing here seeing this rubbish? <laughs> <laughs> and it was Joan. And, uh, I mean, it couldn't have been better from my point of view, you know, like these two people come over in Australia. <laughs> and Joan, his first words here, hear her up to, you know. And she said, she took us back for a drink in a, in a little room at the back. And, and I've never forgotten it, because there was a, there was, she gave us, a, she was giving us a drink and there was, we were sort of general chat, you know, and so forth. And a young guy came in who was uh, an actor and he'd been in, the, in this children's show that afternoon. And he came in and he was really angry and he said, I came here to work with... Is it OK? It's perfect. I came here to work with you and I've been here for three weeks and I haven't met you or you haven't spoken to me or you know something like this and she said uh, why should I bother speaking to you you'll never be an actor <laughs> and he said he said how how do you know you've never you've never met me how do you know she said you play a detective don't you in that play he said, yes, that's right. She said, I was under the stage the other night, clearing up some junk uh, that was left, at, uh, and, uh, and I heard you walk across the stage. <laughs> and I thought, he'd never be an actor. He doesn't know how a policeman walks. <laughs> and she said, I know how a policeman walks. Albert knows how a policeman walks, which wasn't actually true, you know. You don't know, fucking know how a policeman walks. <laughs> and I thought, I thought that that was really, she, she knew everything that was happening in her theatre, you know, you know, like, she knew this guy, what he did, what part he played and everything, and he had nothing to do with, with the, with her, th you know, it was just a group that had come in and was performing this children's uh, children's play. But uh, I was I was quite pleased that she thought <laughs> you have a policeman walk. But I mean, it's it's absolutely true, connected with her, with her whole work, of course. I, I mean that it was all connected with the uh, what the theatre of the street, if you like to call it, how people do things, you know how the language people, you know, all, all that stuff. She started that in whole ages before she went down to, uh, down to the theatre workshop. Clive taught me to use, to use uh, games uh, as a way of, uh, originally as a way of warming up or whatever you, you, you call it. But I, I think I, I took them a lot further because I was lucky at Bradford in having this this block work with students where I would have a group of students for a fortnight who'd chosen to come and work with me because they wanted to and the hours were there was no timetable I mean the hours were what we agreed to work and so on so that we would we would be with each other for a fortnight developing developing work and uh, that was where I started exploring ways in which games could move from from just uh, warm-up exercises into kind of forms of of theater themselves you know and I know we we developed a particularly a lot of uh, blindfold games that uh, eventually turned into performance pieces you you know in fact <laughs> I was leaving Bradford I'd already left Bradford and I was going to go back into adult education and work somewhere else and in my last week at Bradford I did a did did a, a project with a group of students on ga using games and we used we used blindfold games and we turned we produced a kind of performance at the end which was really about Vietnam, though we never, 
we never made a fuss about it being Vietnam, but we had a, everybody was blindfolded on the stage and one guy had an, was covered his eyes with an American flag and so on, the, the, the rose, things like that. And they were all dead when he touched them with his stick and they all piled up at the, at the front of the, the stage. And uh, they, were, they, were, they wore different colored masks or different color, they were a different color so that you knew which were Americans and which were the other side but when they were all dead they were all piled up together on, on the stage and then then uh, somebody came and resurrected them at the end I remember. I, I, I don't I can't remember the, th the whole thing but but we I know that we worked for a week on it and at the end we invited uh, students from other departments to come and and see what we'd uh, what we'd done and it was the first <laughs> it was the first piece of successful theatre I'd ever done I think well, not quite but more or more or less you know suddenly I realized that, that just playing these these blindfold games uh, could produce a, a bit a, a play <laughs> without words you know and 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 it was it was extraordinary. And I remember Peter Brook came up in the middle of that when, when we were doing, when we were working on it. He he came up and, and spent spent a day. He was when he was, when he was uh, collecting a team to go and do U.S. eventually. And and he, I think Jeffrey Rees must have got him to come up and anyway. And uh, and he uh, he he accepted being blindfolded and started. Uh, Started trying, and I've never known, I've never known anyone play the game more violently. I mean, he terrified. The, the one thing we, the one thing we said was that you, when the, you were blindfolded, you must not, to, not to attack, not hurt people. You know, you must be careful not to. And Peter just lashed out. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was quite an extraordinary. Absolutely. I mean, that was when he, when I first, must have been almost the first time I met him. I don't know, can't have been, but not not far off. It was before. It was when he was getting a team to do U.S. together, and 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 he took he took various various bits of stuff that we'd done at, at Bradford in in the early versions of U.S. He 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 used the the blindfold thing for, but, but I mean, it, it, it got dropped almost immediately. I was, and I was very pleased it did get dropped because it wasn't, it wasn't working at all, you know. I mean, he'd, he'd got it so that, although they were blindfold, they could see, you see, you know. It was, it was all ridiculous. It was, it, Peter took, Peter took the games that, that I'd learnt from Clive and also some that I'd developed myself, you know. And then he turned them back into naturalist theatre somehow. I mean, it was, I mean, all his life, the, the, the further Peter was trying to get away from naturalism, the more he, 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 he got back to it, you know. I mean, it was, uh, it was, it was extraordinary, but uh, yeah, yeah. There are so many, there are so many ways, I said a, a little while ago that I think my life would have been totally different if mm. I'd never met him. Yeah. And there are so many moments that I remember that, that, that he, he affected my, my life radically that if I'd if he hadn't been there, I would have wouldn't have never gone on and done the things that I did. It was Clive that got me to Dresden. I mean, this was this I think was one of the most incredible experiences in my life. You know, it was quite late on. I'd almost given up theatre anyway. Then I was work messing about with video and and, and things like that. And Clive, he had these connections in East Berlin, the Berliner, and 
and also that other theatre in East Berlin, the Deutsche Theater, was it called? And and he he you know he'd written a novel. You know about this. <laughs> he'd written a novel which had been published. <laughs> published in, in German translation in, in East East Germany. He, he had all these these connections, you know? And and I'd been trying to I'd been doing this Dresden show for for years and it had started we didn't when we first did it we really didn't know what we were doing at all. I mean we were trying to find a way of destroying a city on the stage and we didn't know how to do it you know and 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 over the years it somehow kept coming back and i mean the, the, one of the most remarkable evenings i was spent in theater was performing it to a group of raf <laughs> raf men at a base somewhere you know i mean it, it was extraordinary thing but anyway this i'd always had this sort of wild dream of uh, of taking the show to Dresden but I had no contacts there at all. although I had been to the Berlin once or twice but I, I really had no contacts there at all you know and Clive, Clive sort of rang and said uh, how would you like to take the Dresden show to to Dresden and I said yeah well yeah he said oh well I fixed it <laughs> And and uh, and we, I mean, we went and uh, and performed. This was really quite. It is connected with Clive because it wouldn't have happened but for Clive. But I mean, it was quite extraordinary. I mean, I got people from Australia staying with me. They'd come back with me from from Australia. So we had this group that was made of uh, a lot of people from Bradford, people I'd worked with for years from Bradford, a few that had come back from Australia, you know, and and I finally set about putting putting a piece of, the piece of theatre together it, so that we could take it to East Germany. And I can remember saying, well, we're not going to, we're not going to take it to East Germany and just just say how wicked the the British have been in burning Dresden, you, you know. So I got hold of there was some real reactionary that I was in touch with who lives in Switzerland. He'd written a book I've forgotten the name of it, but he'd written a book about uh, Nazi Germany and, and and so on, and I'd been writing to him, arguing with him about what he'd said and, and, and so on. Uh, but I, I used the material from his book to write, which was a, a, an account of what had happened when, after the Yalta conference, when Stalin had, uh, had occupied Eastern Poland, you, you, you know, and, and, and how the GDR, the East Germany, had actually been formed. This was to be formed in East Germany, you know. So I got all this stuff and I wrote, I wrote some scenes together in which uh, there was uh, the big three and, uh, you, you know, and they were a comic group called the big three. <laughs> <laughs> consisting of Stalin, uh, Stalin, uh, Roosevelt, who turned into Harry Truman, and and uh, and Churchill, who turned into Attlee. But but anyway, there was this comic group called the called the Big Three, and and I wrote uh, I, I wrote the these scenes to put at the beginning of the. Of the uh, the play. and also at the same time I'd come across uh, Slaughterhouse Five. Is it in Slaughterhouse Five that there's Billy Pilgrim? Am I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd come across Slaughterhouse Five, so I wrote in a character. <laughs> 
the character of Billy Pilgrim, we had this this comic group called the Big Three, and there was this character of Billy Pilgrim who wandered through the the show, not knowing what he was doing, you, you know, and so on. And then we, I got a lot of slides, uh, and we created this. Well, ages before that, we'd, we'd, we'd created a, we were faced, when we first started do, doing Dresden, and I talked to Clive a lot about it, you know, when we first started doing this show about Dresden, how could you build a city on the stage? I mean, it, it was just you couldn't do it, you know. And my kids here in this house, they got, they were very young, my boys were very young, and they got uh, some plain wooden bricks that they started, and they used to sit there on the, on, on the mat there and build up complex mm. things that balanced against each other and extraordinary buildings, you know. And I got this idea from watching them of, well, there were two things. One was that we would, we would use cardboard boxes uh, and build them up, in, build a city up in the same abstract way that uh, the that, that children with bricks built them up. And then the other was that I've been trying to do it for years, create a scene in which which lasted 18 minutes because it took it took 18 minutes for the RAF to to start the Dresden firestorm there were three raids and the first raid lasted only 18 minutes and by the time they went the Dresden firestorm was going so we we developed a way where you you built a city with cardboard boxes that we got from Morrison's and Woolworths and anywhere around, you know, we would just go out before a performance and find some cardboard boxes and we built these and there, would be, there were slides on the, we had a screen with, with slides on of, of Dresden before and after the, the bombing and then, then uh, we, we destroyed the city on stage for 18 minutes and we had a there would be about four or five actors on the stage and they all developed their own ways of destroying cardboard boxes and we had somebody reading David Irving's account of the destruction of Dresden and and we'd had we'd had the light we'd had Sorry, when we were building the city at the beginning, we didn't have the stage lights on. We had a, a series of slides that we shot on the screen at the back. And in front of these slides that were shot on the screen, there were people came on and doing rather mysterious things in the dark, but you couldn't, you couldn't see what they were, except that they were quite pretty patterns that that built up in front of the in front of the screen so that and and as you built the boxes up bits of images from the screen would appear on the boxes so that you would get a face and you, <laughs> It was extraordinary, just extraordinary image used to, and it was built up in the dark, and the actors built built it up as it went on, and the screen was on, and then suddenly we banged all the lights on, and it all looked very mysterious in the dark. You know what's going on? They're really very, very mysterious, and then we banged all the lights on, and they're just a pile of cardboard boxes. You you know. And then for 18 minutes, we 
we dis oh we had a clock that's right this was a key thing because if people didn't know the reason why it didn't work in the early performances was that people didn't know what they were looking at and how long it was going to go on but we had a clock that was set for the time the 18 18 minutes so somebody would start the clock and then uh we had somebody in a kind of pulpit reading David Irving's account of the of the uh, the destruction, and and the everybody on the stage would start smashing up boxes, and they all all the actors had developed their own ways of, uh, of smashing up boxes. We'd re by this time we'd rehearse it so well that we knew how the eighteen minutes was gonna gonna go, you know. And there was one guy who who cut boxes in strips with a pair of scissors and there was another who banged it down with it with a big hammer you, you know so they made all sorts of sounds as well and meanwhile there's this reading going on from David Irving's book about the you, you know and it was uh, and at the end there was just a, a pile of cardboard boxes on the on the stage just total rubbish you, you know and uh, and uh, after 18 minutes, uh, a whistle was blown, and and it was the end of the match or or whatever. And then uh, a girl came on and sang, uh, "Tomorrow is St Valentine's Day," you know, from Shakespeare. "Tomorrow is St Valentine's Day." Uh, standing in for by this time, the the picture on the screen was a ruins of Dresden after the uh, after the bombing, and and uh, uh, that. Uh, it was uh, anyway. What I was going to say was, I'm sorry, I've wandered a long way. What I was going to say was, Clive had arranged for us to to take this to Dresden, and I'd written this scene at the beginning, which was uh, which was the the comic big big three, and and uh, after the first performance ended in Dresden. I mean, this is my, my dream, like, you know, taking the destruction of Dresden to Dresden and the, the show ends. And, and, oh, I ought to add something. We had a, the man who was playing Stalin was a black guy from Somalia or somewhere like that, Egypt or somewhere. And uh, he was a terrible actor, but he'd insisted on playing Stalin because uh, he was a great admirer of totalitarianism in general. And, and uh, the group had set off before me to get to Germany and it turned out, I'd checked all the, the passports and visas and, and everything. It had never occurred to me to pay any particular attention to this guy. And, uh, he rang me to say uh, he couldn't go through Germany because he had a he didn't have a, 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 a you know he didn't have a British passport. I didn't know he didn't have a British passport. So so, so the guy who was playing Stalin <laughs> is stuck stuck somewhere in London. <laughs> you know, so we had to. We had to rejig <laughs> this this great dream of my life, you know, to perform the destruction of Dresden in Dresden, and we had to rejig it because the leading actor wasn't <laughs> wasn't there. And we did, anyway, we, we 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 got through it, and and afterwards, in the performance in Dresden, after the performance in Dresden, there were a lot of young guys there. And they were all young communists, and they got up one after another and denounced us for having uh, said uh, said that Stalin was a member of a comic. I mean, they they were no great admirers of Stalin, but they weren't going to have him as a member of a comic group. That you, you know, so and and so the great row breaks out after we've done this first, this performance in Dresden, and this goes on for about twenty minutes, I suppose, in a kind of discussion. One after another is condemning us and. An old woman stands up at the back after this has gone on for about 20 minutes and she says, and I w it all had to be translated for us, you know, 
and she says, uh, oh, uh, I was in Dresden on the night he was bombed and uh, I haven't I haven't been able to talk about it to my children for years because whenever I mention it they say oh that old thing again you, you, you know and she said they it must have been the second night of the performance actually she said because I came with them last night to the performance and when we got back home they said oh <laughs> tell us tell us what happened you know this was, must have been the second performance that we did yeah I mean what you know it's just extraordinary and then when we took it to when we we took it to East Berlin and again this was Clive because Clive knew all these people in in uh, in the Berliner Ensemble and the Deutsche Theater and all this and Clive arranges for us having arranged for us to go to to Dresden he then arranges for us to go and play in the in the Berliner Ensemble you know I mean we weren't playing in the main theatre but one afternoon we played in to a group of Berliner Ensemble actors and I mean we so we did the we did this performance at the in the uh, Berlin Ensemble Theatre and Clive was sitting be, behind me and and immediately afterwards a discussion arose and there was we went through this whole stuff again about uh, about uh, you know Stalin wasn't wicked in the same way that, that this kind of thing and then uh, somebody said why did you have all that comic stuff at the beginning about uh, having Stalin as a member of a comic group you know and another guy got up on the stage a German guy a German professor of some kind and began a long speech about which had to be translated so I understood it about how this was all connected with British Music Hall and the history of the British Music Hall and you 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 had to be aware when a, a British group came and performed in this comic comic way it was because they were affected by British Music Hall and Clive was sitting behind me and he kept digging me and he said go on tell him <laughs> go on tell him tell him so when this guy had finished, sat down, I said, well, uh, actually, we thought we'd got it from Brecht. <laughs> <laughs> and then I quoted, I quoted the Brecht thing about, I could find the quotation, but it doesn't matter, but, but it, it, it's a quotation about, it's the theatre's first job to be, to be amusing other things it can be but it's got to be it's got to be entertaining you you know there is nothing so I can't get the exact word no so sacred as entertainment or something like that and uh, anyway I quoted this and the guy <laughs> the guy stood up on the stage and he said well uh, of course uh, if you come and uh, you think you know more about Brecht than we do, <laughs> and I, which is what not what I'd intended to say, to say at all. But it was a, it was an extraordinary uh, event, and uh, and it was uh, it was totally organised by you know it was a, it would never have happened without Clive at all. One other thing I've got to. While I'm talking about that, it was an extraordinary thing. Uh, a woman came up to me after the after the performance in Berlin, an old woman, and she said, uh, "I was uh, I was in the mountains outside Dresden on the night of the firestorm." And I saw, I saw the firestorm and the bombing and 
everything. And then it was about three days before I could get down to get into Dresden to find out what had happened. And she said, uh, and when I got there, there were, and she showed it like this with her hands, there were bodies all over the street that had been shriveled by the, the heat of the firestorm. And she said, uh, I'll never, I've never been able to forget those bodies. And then she said, and now I'll never be able to forget your cardboard boxes. <laughs> and I, I thought, my life had been connected with Peter Brook. Peter Brook once said, I'd read an article when I was, when I was very young, I'd read an article in Encore by Peter Brook, in which he said what he was looking for was necessary theatre. Theatre had to be as necessary as food and drink and all, all these other things, you know. And I thought, well, I can't really think of any, any piece of theatre that would be more necessary than this, you know. And, and uh, it was almost the last performance that I was involved in, I think. I won't say it was the last, but it was virtually the last performance I was involved in. And I thought, well, I mean, I won't say I consciously thought it at the time, but, uh, but well, I can't do anything better than this, you know, do something else. It was that, that kind of uh, feeling, you know. And Clive, uh, that all came about because of Clive, completely, you know. When I, when I said earlier that, that Clive had very much affected my life, that was one of the episodes I was trying to remember, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah.